15th, 2010, we're going to be interviewing Richard Greg Leslinski. At the, he's a resident of the Pine Ridge Retirement Community at 43707 Hayes Road in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Uh, Richard is a veteran who was born in Hamtramck, Michigan, November the 8th, 1921. And uh, just for the record, uh, Richard, can you tell us a uh, branch of service that uh, you were in? U.S. Army uh, Artillery. The Army Field Artillery. Artillery. Field Artillery. Okay. 687 Field Artillery. Okay. And uh, today, uh, the interviewers were our, uh, Pat Perlinski and myself, Jim Buckley, and our videographer is Gary McGiglio. And, uh, we're, we're just going to start in a very informal way with uh, your, your youth and uh, high school years and so forth, I guess. If you were born in Hamtramck, is that where you were raised? And I was raised all the way until I got into service. Okay. Born and raised. I went to St. Florian Elementary School, first and eighth grade. I had all my academic uh, magic. It was a Polish. <laughs> school. So we had to learn Polish and English. Oh, I see. Both subjects, English, arithmetic, and everything. We learned double. So grammar, English, and all that was, we had to know it in English and in Polish. And my name's Polish and all that, but uh, I had one hell of a time learning to speak the language real good. I had five, four older brothers, and being in the Polish neighborhood, most of the people had large families. I came from a family of seven. I was the fifth boy, and I had two younger sisters after. And uh, I was born in Hamtramck at Norwalk, 2743, Norwalk Street, Hamtramck. My midwife, my mother, had all the children, my midwife at that time with the exception of the last child. She was having a difficult time delivering the baby, so they had to call in a doctor, and that's all the time she had a, a doctor. Otherwise, it was a midwife. And they botched our records from every one of us uh, boys, and even the girls, that pronounced my mother's maiden name absolutely different. Than each one of our records was a different spelling. Oh, of yeah. Our my mother's name, main name was Warren. Uh, my grandparents, they came from the, the, the old country. My dad came from the old country. My mother was born here in the United States. Her parents came from the old country. As far as my schooling, like I say, I went to Antranic, uh, uh, St. Foreign uh, Elementary School to eighth grade. They didn't have a high school at that time yet, so I went to the the Copernicus Junior High School in Hamtramck, and then from there to Hamtramck High School. It was uh, 1941 I graduated, so at 39 I went to the high school. 36 I graduated from the St. Florian Elementary School. Well, at, at home, did you speak Polish or English or combination like I, of it or what? I. My dad would speak Polish to me and not answer in English and get a whop. <laughs> but uh, I could just, like I said, it was just helpful for me to speak Polish because in the neighborhood with the children, us guys and girls and all that, we all wanted to be American. And that's why I told my dad, I said, I'm American, not Polish. And we come back to the story about that later. <laughs> uh, so, like I say, all and then uh, from graduating in June, I, war was naturally if you being the selected service being done. So I wanted to serve the country, so I had a hernia and I had an operation then, 41 in late September or August. So I got prepared to join the service, but I wouldn't enlist, I wanted to be drafted. And I was drafted, well, the day I was Got my notice, my greetings from the president was on my birthday, November 8th. 
and on December 31st was I was inducted at Fort uh, Wayne. In December. Fort Wayne, Indiana, was that? No, no, right here in Detroit. Oh, okay. Fort here in, in Detroit, yeah. okay. And uh, being on December 31st, passed by physical, and since it was Christmas Eve, the crowd I had hung around with was having a Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve party. So naturally, they offered a seven day leave in order to get our personal things together. So I took the seven days and waited. <laughs> okay. So I, on the January 7th, I, from Fort Wayne over here in Detroit, we were shipped to Fort Custard. That's where I was inducted. I took out my clothing, instructions on how to behave and be in the service. From there, after two or three days being orientated in our physicals and our shots and so forth, I was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is located in Lawton, Oklahoma. The day I arrived over there, uh, the general came and inspected us, inductees and uh, draftees, and the recruits for the artillery. He looked us over, patted me down and all, he says, uh, cavalry, and I hated horses. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hate the horses, horses hated me one or the other. Because, uh, so I was cried there, right there and then. But then, the cavalry was motorized. When we would come in, the field artillery and the motorized one, which was a godsend for me. Another thing then, besides that, then there was a rumor at the time that <laughs> they would make us uh, mountain artillery. It's with the donkeys and the mules. Oh. Mule pack artillery. It that didn't sound good, but uh, I fortunately, I, because of my education and the courses I took in school, in the special high school commercial course, I was prepared and they put me into the Battery B of the Fort Sill Training Corps, Battery B. And that was for clerk of work. So when we finished basic training... How long was basic? It's supposed to be 16 weeks, but uh, due to the fact they gave us a uh, little time to, because I went to a higher administrative school that was in Oxford, Mississippi. Well, anyway, they gave us uh, basic training, uh, not basic, after basic, before we could be assigned to an outfit like some. We were sent right to an uh, outfit that was going overseas. I was fortunate. They tried to make me an officer, and I refused. And I says, off record? Yeah, off record. And it never was off record. It was on record why I refused. <laughs> I refused for, because there was rumors around that if you weren't a good one, you weren't going to make it back. So I didn't tell them that, but I just said that I didn't have the education and I wasn't qualified to be an officer. They said, no, I was, and that I was a good leader. And I said, well, I'd rather not. So they says, anything, you looked at the bulletin board, anything there that you want to be, if you go to the officer's training school. I says, yeah, there's one thing I'd like to be in the forestry. And they laughed. He says, are you kidding? I said, no, I love out the side work. He says, that is a closed training. Oh, the people get that schooling, you know, training for all the forestry is generals and their kidding folk. <laughs> all the big shots, that's where they send their children. <laughs> and they did the officer to get a training in that. He says, that we can't help you out there. I said, no, I'd rather not become an officer or try to become an officer. So they sent me to a higher administrative school. I had it somewhere here. I thought I had, but my buddy here, he, he messed me up. He put all this stuff around. Well, it was my graduation. We were the last class that graduated. We were at the University of Mississippi. And if I remember right, the dormitory I was in, where they had that uh, little ride back in the 
at, at that time of that Dollar Fall that was entered the Mississippi school and it was so happened that the same dormitory that I spent my time there, that was about five weeks over there. Uh, like I say, I got a promotion when I was a basic to a technician, fifth grade, the corporal. And then uh, being at uh, the schooling over there, they also trained, tried to get me to become an officer. And they told me I had qualifications for other duties besides the clerk. And I said, no, I'm happy with what I was going to do. So when we graduated there, I was shipped to the Fort Silicon. And I cried again. I said, no, they, it, that, that, that place was for the Indians. Yeah, that's out of no man's land, right? Well, not that so much. Uh, soldiers and dogs. No, dogs and soldiers keep off the grass. Yeah. No, they weren't very friendly for uh, for uh, for uh, that. And that that was a uh, uh, a military fort originally. And they just, I guess, the soldiers weren't welcome in town because I guess when they got to leave and all that, they didn't. They already, there was Cause, a bunch of anything in there. Caused a commotion to them. Right. Up, disrupted the local people. Right. They, okay, they so it. after you uh, finished basic and your ad advanced training then, then, then what did you do? Then I was shipped, like they say, back to Fort Sill to the Mount Rudolph, the 687 field artillery. I met my commanding officer of Battery B. He was said he looked over my records and he thought he had the place for me and I'd become his personnel headquarters clerk. And he gave me the instructions and he gave the first section the instructions. I wasn't allowed to have, be on any assignments, no KP, no duties, drills or nothing. My job was to take care of the servicemen's records. And I was the bad thing, like I say, the headquarter clerk. And he didn't want no women folk complaining that they weren't getting their allotments or the husbands were. Well, kind of like what, what enabled you to get to this point? Like, were you a, a typist or something that, that, that most of the fellows couldn't do? You know, some other well, like some say, yes, skills it's, like it's, that? Yeah, that was uh, typing, uh, the filing. So you, 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 this, these are things you learned in school that right. you carried with you and yeah, right. put the good nice. use. Yeah, that's, that's nice. kind of unusual, you know. And I know in those days, you know, there weren't too many young men that had typing skills. Yeah, well, like, like I say, that. it wasn't the hunt, hunt and pick. I, the regular. Uh, yeah. I had 58 over six. Was my typing skill the days I took. So due to the fact, like I say, then, well, he told the sergeant, and I was a little disappointed in the, at the end of the, my uh, services that I didn't mingle when I got become a prisoner of war, that I was more familiar and had more association with the men in the outfit. But I was isolated, really. He thought I was a a spy or some where I'd be giving the information to the guys, you know, you know, and stuff. And he told me one time when I was ready to go overseas and I had to go through the, some of the basic courses because the little record showed that I was in the infiltration course. And he says, you were in charge of records and you didn't take care of those that things? I says, hey, I was just in charge of the service record, the enlistment service, not the other stuff, the personal, there were so many other eyes, I do one file, and other files were, they had a paper where they punch you on a thermometer and that would give you your, uh, all, all that information that they put in, 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 yeah. uh, in a certain machine, yeah, like, like, give like, you the history like of Like you complete the infiltration course yeah. requirements and all those That things. would be yeah. recorded on that thing. Yeah. You know? and he possibly thought I was, it charged all records, so I wasn't just the personal record to where I put down on those days. He would, well, the shots when he took, if there was any uh, charges against the uh, W charges or anything, it was just a person went in. Also, I did the payroll. I did the, the, the 
solicitants payable. So that, then uh, when you were were leaving there and, and uh, you got your orders, where were you assigned to? We, when, when we were uh, at the, I, I, was, I got there in July or, or August to my office in Fort Sill and I returned mm -hmm. to the office in City 7. There we were for a couple of months, then we were shipped to uh, to California for basic uh, more maneuvers in training for overseas. Then uh, over there, we were shipped. Then I did, we got notices that we would be shipped out. So naturally, everybody was asking me, "Where are we going? East or west?" I says, "I don't know." We fact, I didn't know where, which way we go, because when we were getting a new issue, because all of us had to get a new issue of clothing. All my clothing was dismantled, and that's the story there. I had my overcoat, and as the captain, CEO was coming down and inspecting, and telling the supply sergeant what clothing I'd be needing, I asked him, and I said, sir, this is the only cool thing for my original issue I had. Can I keep this overcoat? He says, okay. So I kept that overcoat and that's a little story behind that too. And uh, so I got orders, the vans to go with Captain Mitchell and Lieutenant uh, Leslie to go overseas in the dance party. And that's the boat. You, you seem to have gotten a lot more uh, training than most of the fellows that we've spoken to. You know, so many of them got like six weeks of training and then they were shipped out somewhere. And, you know, you know you, you've got uh, quite a bit of, of uh, prep I mean, work I, before you actually went overseas. Thank you, because the reason for that is because of my education. Yeah. My education, like I went to high school, to the high school, then I went to business and college for a while. And then, uh, like I say, that all fell into when I took my test at Fort Sill, I mean, Fort Custer, that fell into how I uh, yeah. progressed. How you tested out and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the boat, we sailed, we boarded the boat on January 30th, uh, 1944, and we left. Fort Hamilton, that was where we were at. And we left there and we went down to Hudson Bay and we boarded the uh, Marauder, or maybe you can pronounce that name better than that. That's supposed to be the second largest ship that England had. We had the bottom of the NA, right over there. That's the ship, so we were on. Okay. Yeah. Marietta, possibly. Yeah, that's that's. Is that the way it's yeah. pronounced? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's supposed to have been the second largest ship. It was a luxury liner before it was converted into a cotton the transport container. So you had you had then before you went overseas, you had a full years of train, full year of training. Yeah, well, uh, our, in various right locations. That that outfit we were at. That for since '87 field artillery was a training uh, outfit for all officers enlisted in, and our outfit was training other outfits. In the fact, they broke up our outfit and made another outfit out of it, and that outfit was sent overseas sooner than ours. And the rumor was, because we were train a training outfit, that we would never go overseas. And a lot of the fellows, like gung ho guys like me. <laughs> Uh, we didn't like the idea, and a lot of went AWOL due to the fact that it was an outfit that was really supposed to be assigned for training purposes only. That's why maybe I had more time in the States than oh. normal people. But when we got orders to go to, uh, that we were being shipped to the this deserts in California, that's when a lot of the regular Army men flew the coop. They didn't know they were weren't happy that we'd be going overseas, and uh, I was assigned before I was 
in December, so I got the notice that I was going overseas to pick up a few LBO boys. And then, like I say, I returned back from that assignment, special assignment, and we were on the maneuvers. This um, Hudson that they talk That's about Hudson in, in, this, in, in your booklet, uh, is that in California or? No, no, that's in New York. In New York, so, okay, so I, I, I got, yeah, okay, I, I got misled. So you, yeah. you, you went from then to? From Fort Sill, uh, like to, I say, to uh, the desert to California. And then, and then, and then back the, to New York State. Back to New York and okay. we were there with the, we saw our Statue of Liberty and we waved goodbye to it. Okay. And yeah. uh, like I say, it took seven days, I think. As I uh, said, that we had a maneuver every seven minutes, which is exact. So the subs wouldn't hit a convoy right. in, in their boat. And it took eight minutes, according to the statistics. It took eight minutes the time they rise, the subs rise, and start to fire at any spotted ships. It took eight minutes, so that's why we say that. So it made seven minutes eight, eight minutes for like the torpedo to arrive at the point right. that they were firing at. Mm -hmm. I see. And then when we arrived in Liverpool on February 12th at Birmingham. And then from there, like I said, it was the advance party to the Alpha came over overseas. The, the, then where did you go when, once you, once you got to Liverpool in England? Then what, what did you do? Well, we went to some castles someplace. We went also on maneuvers in Wales. Uh, that the Wales do were. That okay. was a wonderful place, the Welshman. And it was always, you talk about uh, log, London fog, and that place was man misty all the time. From there, when, uh, when we left that place, our alpha was, our battery was selected to test all ammunition that were in the depots for overseas firing. We had to test them, see their velocity, length, and all that. And the uh, colonel came from Mer the pool grounds in Maryland. And did you fire then? Uh, I, the first that the that's the story. Like the cat that you, I never fired was with the I mean, even drills or anything, they were firing, and he asked me to come up front when they were testing this ammunition. He says, Gregory, he says, you ever uh, see the missiles fired? I says, no, I've never been uh, on a range. So he said, along, stand, stand alongside me on the left of me, and when I how I fire, you jump. <laughs> he says, because the, you and then the pilot tried to see if they were where that missile goes. And I had when he said fire, I was looking at it, he said he pointed with uh how I said with the uh, I should watch. When he out of fire they shot and I jumped and grabbed the hole in it when I jumped and uh he said, Open your mouth just like when you go in that elevator, he says, You gotta get that so you're old get that. So he said, did you see that missile go? I said, yeah, I saw that thing twirling around and the, and the steam coming out of it. He says, back to your job. And I said, because uh, I've used a lot of the machine calculators and all that. And, uh, and then, then I get the information which lot was for what uh, uh, the ammunition place. And we'd, say what the firepower and we did and attack the colonel got the like main in those three days we worked on that project he wanted me to join his outfit to stay with him and go to the other places in this to Egypt and other places to test have and then to be one of his clerk I refused and well in fact my captain he says Gregory he says I got good news or bad news which way are you on it he says, you're offered a sergeant's uh, promotion and the colonel wants you to go with him to Egypt. I said, you gotta be kidding. I said, I just got to know you people. <laughs> I said, I'd rather prefer to stay with the outfit. And by any means, 
he did talk to moderate, and fortunately, he did talk to Colonel Moderate. Were you involved in, in keeping those records of the the results of your no, firings? No, no, no. And All that things? is that uh, make the record, and he, the, the Colonel from Cruz uh, Grounds, Merlin, he kept that, and he had to send it anywhere. And the, from there, is, they knew what allotments, what. The, Artillery uh, shells right. were really good for overseas duty. Well, because the war was going on then and so forth, so like not where, necessarily yet. No, no, no. It didn't get that far yet. No, no, no. That was before. That was the, the, the ammunition before the invasion. So they knew if the. Well, I, I, okay, in other I, words, there were good ammunition or bad ammunition. I, I guess what I was kind of thinking is. They were they were fighting in Europe and so forth. No, forward. not yet. No, no. Not? It was before the invasion. Oh, okay. It was before the invasion, and uh, well, uh, like I say, from there we went. Uh, they were. That was a little bit later. Okay. Yeah, because when the, the D Day came, we then uh, really uh, get go to overseas because we'd be in artillery. We were the Last ones to uh, June 6th with invasion, and we went to Utah Beach around July 18th. We didn't really start your boat up. Were those mostly like um, can like wheel type cannons, uh, the artillery uh, that you were involved in? Or, oh, no, or they, what, they, what they were, were like I say, motorized. They were trucked by uh, trucks. They were you were it's down behind of a truck. But they, they have wheels on them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of what I, yeah. I envisioned that you were involved with. Yeah. Like I say, it wasn't really, never involved the scene that fired with, the, with that one exception. And that was, I was away from the firing the place. But uh, then, like I said. Yeah, then, then, then what did you do after that? Once, once. Well, we, went still, like I said, we went to, we were at the, uh, at St. Germain and the Viril is one of the first places we landed. And that's when we got to see all the soldiers and ammunition going up to the fellows that were up in front. We were issued our cage. Like I say, there's a lot of the stuff over here that this lieutenant has. This is his diary, not mine. Mm -hmm. And I, at the last reunion, he gave me this. Not myself personally, but all the people that was interested. Because he was going to write a book on on his uh, uh, time he spent in service. He was a lawyer, so he knew what he was doing. Oh, okay. He knew what he was doing. And he was an enlisted man also. He was a clerk in a battery, and he went to officers training, and he made the officers. At the time, like I say, he was what he called spotters. The defense observations post and that was one of the tougher spots because that would be I don't know how many miles ahead of us of the the batteries and they did give it back the location and then when they fired he tell them whether to the right high low and they just so sort they'd of be on it and when they get around target he said fire at will and that's when the batteries would well then you, did you spend pretty much the rest of your your service um, in in like Europe well, like I say, uh, I, Until, you know, I the, the way we were with the outfit, the word got that we were, the personal records and everything was with the frontline troops, as they were called, and we were ordered back to Corps. And that was about September when our outfit was, had a little break, and they had to re-clean their equipment and get it back into the shape of firing again. They did do a lot of action. They didn't do. We at times would even pass up the infantry as we advanced. The boys would be walking, and we'd be ahead of them, sitting in the camp and sitting in our place. And before they even got to their look, uh, their their destination, and we'd be there before we they would, and we fired onto the new locations like. And gave them a little break where they had it a little more than hit it the direct fire. 
they had already a little support so that they could keep moving. And like I said, we was the Third Army, Ninth Army. We were, uh, as you call, the uh, bastard outfit because uh, we were not assigned. We were with the 28th Division, 9th Division, and each one was a different. We were Patton. We were with Patton when we was in England. That's one of his favorite speeches that he blundered on when he made a few remarks and they had a put him back where he was supposed to go on the, on the nation and they sent him back. They didn't send him front because he made some that they heard but bad remarks about the Russians. And, and uh, he was sent back and he lost his command. And but it wasn't went, politically correct. He, well, but he used to, the, I was the, supposed to see them. So we were sent over there the, our personnel matter was sent over there, but there were so many of us going there, they didn't do us. That's when he made the speech in Avon, uh, England. That's when he made the speech. And when he was making the speech, he was on that river paddling a canoe. Well, you, you mentioned when, before we got started uh, a little bit in our converse, you know, pre-conversation uh, about being a prisoner of war. Yes, uh, Can you tell us a little about that, maybe. Now on that looks look to the word when the bulge started on December 16th, that was we were are out the car troop personnel. We were stationed in Luxembourg, and orders came up for us personnel clerk cooks, and they're all the river echelon people. We were supposed to defend that town. We got orders and our ammunition, but none of us were really experienced any really direct firing. No combat uh, duties, because we were all back clerks and all that. So orders came out also that when the, the Germans came through, and uh, we spent that night there, and then we got orders to evacuate the town. When we left that town, we ran into a Outfit, there's a, a hospital outfit, the nurses and doctors and their patients. They were trying to get back to the the other town, not the Bastogne, but the other place. A little further out, there was war in rear Islam. So the, the leader that uh, was in charge of us had a little looks, uh, combat experience. He asked his officers and the rest of if it would be all right with us if he went and directed and guided them back to the safety match game. We said, all agreed. There was about 300 of us agreed uh, individually and all that by the leadership that it'd be best that he would take the wounded and the, the doctors and nurses back to more secure program because we were going to the front line and they were going to the back to the rear line. So then we were out at anyone that didn't had any combat experience. So that night, we tried to walk all night. And in the early dawn, we run into a patrol, a German patrol. And so we scattered a, a bunch of us stayed on one side of the road and the other. A group of us went on the other side. That's when we became lost. That's when we became. And then from that day, 16, to the Christmas day, this is when I was captured. We were traveling by night. The weather was just awful. No no stars, no nothing, snowing all the time, colder than, as you know. And uh, we traveled, and we traveled during the nights. And that days we tried to find some place to rest We'd find some nice trees. We'd stand a couple times. We found barn houses, but unfortunately, the people were scared to have us around because they feared the Germans. They, they thought that we were being helped by them, and they, that they were collaborating with us. Too. So we'd have to leave. And some of the were, were, were most of the German folks uh, friendly. Oh, this was a, no. This was in Luxembourg. 
Oh, okay, in Luxembourg, okay. Yeah, this, the, the, these people are all wonderful people. We had a Thanksgiving party for them, for our chefs and our cooks. Made a nice dinner for them, besides us. And then they were but uh, he gave us Christmas dinner. And he brought in champagne from uh, uh, furs and everything else, but we never did get to that one because the whole started before Christmas. And Christmas Eve, it's the first time we really ran into any trouble. We were called to stop. We didn't know whether it was American troop lines or German. And we were told to halt. The fellow that was leading us, Leo Morgan, he was killed that day. Pull us to make all the noise we could. And like me say, you pull up, start staying here, look, speak your language with that. I can't, like I say, I didn't speak good Polish, but I would. Start talking. We all jabbered to make a lot of noise. We were fired upon, and as we left that field, we were fired upon again. And uh, there was one Jewish fellow with us, and he says, Let's make a stand. And I see, he said, I'm Jewish. My name is Greenberg. So you know, I ain't got much hands if we get captured. Mm -hmm. And I said, You do what you want to do, fellow. So I says, I'm going to try to keep going. I tried to cross another field, and there was open fire, and they had tracers. And the bullets went in front of me, in the back of me, and I thought they ripped me right apart, because I could see the bullets <laughs> flying around. And as I run around, I lost my helmet, and in the meantime, I had my mid hat. I'm running, my mid hat got caught in the tree branches, and I'm reaching, the tree, reaching my head, trying to get my mid hat out, back off the branches. And they get some Toby hit the dust. And I hit the ground and sure enough, the bulls could fly it around. And I could hear hitting the branches and all that. And the branches fall down. And I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> so like I say, the day, that night, there were five of us left of a group of ten. So everybody agreed that we could go any longer. Already, you know, six days out there without any food or shelter. And we were well, pretty well beat up. Yeah. So we decided we would uh, surrender. So I told them, the, since we lost our leader, I uh, says, fellas, all your ammunition, anything that would give the enemy any information, destroy it now, throw it away. I said, your weapons, like me, I had a carbine, and the fellow will be had a carbine and the others all had rifles. So I said, this man, this man would just throw a wall over hell. So we come out that we'll be unarmed and there'd be a better chance of us to survive. And while in the well, how we got rumors about uh, that they weren't taking any prisoners, they were killing them. Well, where we got the rumor from or what, I don't know. But as we came out, the five of us, they says 10. We couldn't, you know, communicate. They speak German, and we spoke English nationally. So they asked us how many. They said ten. I said no. Just like that, you know. I mentioned that they were killed or they were, or whatever. They were just at us. So after looking us over, and sure enough, I thought they're going to take our clothing off and our shoes and all that. Because uh, they looked us over quite a good bit. Walked around all those five of us. And they sent us back to their rear echelon. How many other were you? Five of five us. Five other ten. Okay. And originally there was twenty. And we broke into smaller groups and got lost and all that. When we got back to the rear echelon, the guys were eating supper or breakfast, whatever it was. Nice, warm, beautiful. My man was really beautiful to come into a warm place for a change. Smelled the food even. It was as good as he ate. So we were interrogated, given their name and rank to serial number. Naturally, he got shaken down. They took our wallets, took all the valuables out of our wallets, and returned our wallets. And then a while before we got to the rear echelon, <laughs> one of the escorts guards, he says, do you know what day this is? I turned around after, you know, have to talk the sign language. I heard the guy could speak good English. 
I was rather surprised. And I said, no, I don't know what day this is. I know it's a hell of a day, though. He says, Christmas Day. And I said, what a hell of a present. What a present we got. But fortunately, after many years after, I realized it was a good day. If it was maybe any other day, we maybe wouldn't have made it. Right. But being Christmas, they probably were to leave it with us. Probably very fortunate. Uh, yeah, like I say, very fortunate that uh, on Christmas days now, I remember it, the day I was captured. But then, then like I say, thank the Lord that it was Christmas Day, and that there were Christian people that uh, let us live. Well, like you were saying, them firing at you and you having to duck and seek cover and so forth, so probably like saved, say, your, saved your life that day. I must have nine lives like a cat. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many incidents in my life that... Uh, so was that in Christmas of four, 1944? Okay. So, so uh, that, then how long were you a prisoner of war? From uh, December... 25th then. 25th actually, but they're giving me credit as of the 16th, because oh. I was lost in action. Uh -huh. And then we were liberated uh, April 18th. That's when he sent the letter to my mother, state that we were, we were back to the It's one of these telegrams here that we got from the adjutant general. That so your, your mother then, she, she knew that you were a prisoner of war. Oh yeah, they, they were notified that twice. She had got notices about the, the, that I was missing action. Then when they got a report, how I got missing action, they mentioned the part that we ran into this patrol, and that's when I was did, missing did, action. Did your mother like know where you were serving? Because uh, other veterans have told us that their relatives only had like a PO address, and they didn't they censored the letters and things oh, yes. so that they didn't know where they were were serving at the time. You know, yeah. all that was cut out if they listed No, they, uh, they, like I said, they uh, knew where I was at always because we were allowed until we got overseas before the letters were censored. Uh -huh. Where we could not move, like I was born still, where I was oh, yes. <coughs> Even in England, I'd say I was, uh, I couldn't say what town or anything, but I was in England. And uh, in, uh, in the field, uh, but as far as the locality, the name of the city or town or the burg or whatever it was, no, the we couldn't get that information because right. it would be such a were you, kind of. Okay. Uh, were you, how were you treated as a prisoner of war? Well, that's a situation that uh, I am grateful that I always looked at it this way. They were at their end, the Bulger was their last push. And they used every means, and we were even reporting back to court and to the, everybody else, to England, and back that these Germans are preparing for a push. And they did it purposely. The bulge, to my opinion, was a, a strategic move on the United States, and one of their big blunders. They feared that the Germans would come straight at us, but the Germans, when they started the bulge, they were strong on both sides. It was a pincer movement where we figured we'd surround the first group as they do, but they were strong on both ends and we couldn't encircle them. That's why that's why the uh, Bastogne became. Because they were too strong and like I say, they're, they're people at that time were young, young real old, old uh, people. Soldiers are real young 15, 13, 12 years old, so they had to serve. So, did they, they, did they treat you? Uh, well, like I said, I ended, up, I ended up with pneumonia, and I was in the hospital almost the whole the time. I got captured, like I say, I went from the one camp, which was a prison there, work camp, that they had the insane people, and there were real bad cases of murderers and, you know, felons. And that's where we got our first grouping. And from there we marched through two nights to get to the main camp. And 
that was a, a gathering point too for me. And that's when they gathered all of the troops and the, the segregated officers from the list of men. And uh, from there we were sent to Savo 13C. You messed me up. <laughs> <laughs> I had, there they are. This is where I ended up. That's the Stalag we were in. Oh, okay. And I used to get mad at the, that program, Stalag 13, how they were so lenient with the people. And I don't think it was that way. Being, being sick, I uh, know that they weren't treated that good. And they couldn't talk to the officers like they were talking. I laughed at it. made a big joke out of it, and to me it was no big joke. It made a good program for some people. Yeah, that was, that was the television program yeah, years yeah, ago, yeah. right? And then, like, to me, that that was more was with, uh, more like it, but, but that was uh, the officers. They were, uh, Just wait a minute. We have to turn the tape oh, over here. I'm talking too much. No, no, we got plenty of, plenty of tape here. We just have to turn it over. Okay, now we're now we're, now we're all ready. Go ahead. Well, I got one thing in mind now. Like I mentioned a while previously about that overcoat that I had. That was my first issue. Yes. When we were captured, we were walking down the line. Me and this what fell from my uh, off of battery A. Perdom, Warren Perdom was his name. They don't come. And we were walking down, and there was a big movement of a trip of tanks. And the command car was going by, and it stopped suddenly. And this German officer coming out running up, grabbed a hold of me, shook me around, turned around. Because of that overcoat was past the buttons. He thought I was an officer. Oh. <laughs> but he knows that <laughs> I was a private. <laughs> he used to push me on the side because he figured he'd interrogate me and get the information you know, uh -huh. from the officer. But he the uh, listen man, he went back and he was buttering all the way back to go to the, the uh, to his command car. And like I say, that while we were on these marches, going from one place to another. The first day, like I mentioned, you know, after we were interrogated, the first time when the guard spoke English, the fellas that we were working through, the three other fellas besides Dale and myself, they fell right down. And we were passing the place we were building at the duels. And they were going to say something, I shut your face. Don't let them know we were billing in this town, you know. Right. <coughs> and uh, so, did they then uh, try to uh, torture you, or like withhold food, mm. or or things of that nature to like s get information from you, or anything? No, they didn't really do to the fact. Like I say, as we were marching, the three other fellas, they were new, really rookies. They were just from a new outfit. They never really probably. Uh, got their shoes in the, like me, I that uh, look on it and all that for waterproofing them. Right. They didn't. And they had, while we were on those seven, seven days, they used to tell the fellas, take your shoes off, rub your feet, change your socks from right to left. Get, get air in your shoes, wear them out. When these fellas took their boots off, you ever see chopped liver? Man, I mean, it made me sick. Yeah. Just look at their feet, how trench foot their foot feet were. I mean, uh, in fact, when I was interrogated here, uh, 203, uh, right now, uh, it tears my eyes seeing how painful those fellas walking all those miles in days with their feet. I mean, I, I don't think they. 
In fact, the guards had told me to sit over here and wait for somebody else. We can't take it. Then. These fellows who were, they just couldn't go another inch. They couldn't go another inch. Their feet were so bad. Uh, is a lot of that because they didn't? They didn't uh, know how. Like, uh, like change their socks yeah. and so or forth. Take their feet. Yeah. I was fortunate enough. I remember the Stars and Stripes. We used to get those in the rear echelon with the freedom. And they gave instructions to the troops how to react. And when now we were told that we we're going to defend the wills, I took four per socks, that's what I wore. And the big nice crew. And K Red just came up with a nice chocolate bar. And I had about four or five of those and I kept them with myself. And that night, when we did the rest or anywhere, I would unbuckle my shoes, grab my feet, massage them, and grab the wet socks, put them around my body, tie them up so they dry and put in the pearl. But I was fortunate to read this in. Right. And change your socks. Keep your feet warm. Even if your shoes are soaked, you know, if you put a new sock on, and like I say, so I ended up with three socks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I keep losing them. <laughs> so that one sock was made around there, from right foot, left foot, right, left foot, right foot. I was rotating that one, three socks. And, and then they, th at that time, they really didn't know to train the troops. And then I know it's sort of off the beaten path, but when, when I was in the service, which was a number of years later, you know, we even had our boots marked with a white dot. You wore those one day, then you wore the regular boots the, the next day and rotated them. You had your socks you had the air melt. same way and so and on. The same yeah. thing, especially if they had front troops where the foxhole and all that, you know, a lot of water in there, you just, hey, you just, you're submerged in the water, they can't help it. I don't care how you treat it, your clothing or your shoes. Right. They didn't get it just soaked, so that's why it was articles that, that, that I fortunately read. Now, even the guys in my outfit with that Dale, he didn't know that, but he was in the service before I was, and they, and they made all everybody in the outfit had to uh, take care of their boots where they would be uh, waterproof. So, you. When you were the, a prisoner of war, then you basically were treated pretty humanely. Well, like I say, so not, to not, you can't say that. You can't say that we were treated. We weren't treated bad. Let's put it that way. They gave us what they could give us. Mm -hmm. They they had it for their troops. What little supplies, like I say, being in the hospital, we had nothing. We couldn't get name. The French troops refused to give us their stuff. We were from the battle bonds. The other offense, Australia and the other offense, they treated us good. They treated us wonderful. All the time, I, like, I never had a shave till the, uh, I was transferred from the American hospital to the French hospital, from the French hospital, back to the American hospital, then back to the Australian hospital. And then they were moving the troops everywhere. All the, the troops were just being shuffled from one camp to another camp because they are trying to c accommodate the people. Uh, how how were you uh, liberated or uh, released or whatever I from, forget from the, the, uh, the uh, from a, being a prisoner of war? There was uh, some advance party, like I mentioned about the, being in the same area, uh, being a listed camp in uh, Patton's uh, son-in-law was in the uh, Officers came, and it's around Palm Sunday when they tried to liberate his camp, the Patton Sunday lost camp. And those poor fellows they did such a wonderful job. I saw what destruction they did when I was liberated and were going to a the lousy camp often. And then what did what? Their tanks took a beating, but they ran out of ammunition, they ran out of food, they ran out of uh, gas. They just ran out of everything, wow. and that's how they were captured. And these fellas, they put us into the prison, uh, in the, with the hospital men. And naturally, 
hey, how's Oracle? Uh, how what we're doing? And all that. And some of these guys were so demoralized, they just give up. They just give up and two, three of them uh, that, we, that were brought into uh, our uh, uh, confinement in our camp. Our, 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 our hospital room. They just gave up and died that 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 night the three of them died. My they God. just gave and died. And speaking this death. Up, down, long, up, down, everywhere. Even one night the one fell out died, he was still in the way he said to me. And I don't want to wet my house I am getting cold. I just couldn't warm. Sure enough when they went down there. And uh, that the fellow next thing they the name was white. Dead. No, I said, I said, no wonder he's taking all the heat out of my body. Because <laughs> he was, you know, getting uh, the mood. So, like I say, uh, and Did they uh, return those to the uh, folks uh, who passed away to uh, well, back to, back I, to the, the I U.S. Don't know. I don't know, no, because normally our uh, uh, medics would have to take the bodies and let you grab them. Pine wood, so they were buried right there. And then now, uh, maybe they kept records of it. I don't know. Well, at least they they were buried then. Uh, well, the, yeah, they, they they were buried. They were buried. Okay, so after then, you uh, left the prisoner of war camp and so forth. Did you go back then to your the regular outfit? No, uh, former outfit. No, because. Uh, Due to the fact that I was put in the, the wards that had malaria cases, TB cases, all the contagious diseases, I was at that type of a ward. And it was on the, the, the records that they kept. So when I was liberated, I was sent to an evacuation camp. And I was advised by a doctor there. He says, for me, due to my records, that there's a question about me having TB and, and I had pneumonia and all that to go to Third Simmons Hospital, Colorado. But like a heavy man, and I said, Bull Loney, I want to go come home. I said, What's the nearest one in Michigan or something? He says, uh, Fort Custer, uh, Battle Creek. So I went to Battle Creek, and that was known for empty cases. Well, don't I? Let's, we, let's just take a moment. We're going to cha change our tape. We're sent to the uh, hospital in Battle Creek. Well, from uh, from uh, here, when I was in the uh, evacuation hospitals and uh, uh, left, there was a near France, Paris, France. From there, I was flown over, flown home. Non-stop. Well, one way we wouldn't pit stop, and that was in Iceland or Greenland, whatever it was. It's it only stopped with then we landed in uh, Washington D.C. and uh, that was uh, we got. I got back to the states uh, May 30 or 31st of 1945. From there, they flew me in to uh, Battle Creek, Michigan. There I got all my tests. In fact, one test they took the three days they, for gastric stomach ulcers. And I had all the time trying to get the instruments through my nose to one of the technicians knew how to do it right. I never did get the results of that for ulcers. But I was discharged due to arthritis of my knees. And that was, I guess, due to the fact in the hospital, laid up all the time, and also the six, seven days we were in the, in the fields, and we were trying to get the, back to Bastogne. Well, anyway, on October 31st, 1945, I got my discharge from Battle Creek, for the custard, and I came home. So and I mentioned the fact. Then you went I, back to Hamtramck, is that oh, it? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, back home, back home, and I had 
like I said, the fifth, five of us boys, four served, one enlisted, he got in the Air Force, never did really make a lot. The other one was rejected a few times, but they finally took him. And I went in about a month or two later after Clarence. That was his third oldest boy. And then, then I was drafted. And when I was drafted, like I say, I had two of the older brothers. And one, he enlisted and he got in the Navy. And he had become a chef for the officers. <laughs> we left like that a month. <laughs> All guys become a cook. It was him. And the older one, the oldest boy, they kept calling him and trying to get him to uh, get to service. And he, well, they was explained he's the last of the boys in there, you're not going to give him up. So that's why he didn't make it to, to service. But she had four stars in the window for us. So, kind of like what you're saying is if. If a family had four or five boys, and like say four of them were in the service, then uh, the, 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 the fifth one they would not they would did, would not draft would, in most cases. And if he was in essential work and stuff, they grabbed everybody. Right. There wasn't no no uh, uh, restrictions how many or anything like this. All the boys and all that that went into the navy, and they were all killed in the sank. The boat was sank. They named one of the ships after them. But no, they, they try to uh, avoid getting the whole family in one outfit because of the solvents. Mm -hmm. So what they did, if even the twins, we had one set, not in my outfit, but this one, the battery, had three sets of twins. And they broke that up real fast. Mm -hmm. I see. They didn't want the, all, say they probably were the only two uh, set, but was probably the only children in the family. So what they try to do is always break them up so they wouldn't be together. Now, I, I, can re I can remember, I was, was quite young at the time, but seeing the stars on in the With homes of, of folks, you know, who had sons and da or daughters in the service, and I said, well, so your mother had four of you at one time then? Yeah, she had four stars in there. One of the ones in the block that had four stars. Well, then, then once you got back from the service, uh, what did you do? Did you just, like take, take a little bit of a rest or whatever? No, did not you go me. right, right not to work me. or no, well, school or what? I had uh, well, well, I had been uh, well, I was at Fort Custer, the uh, Battle Creek. I got all my leave and all my monies and everything that was due me, and so I spent about oh, I see two months home. So I had another time where I didn't have to go. I was still in the Army. And when I was discharged, the very next day I went and got a job. I had a horse around a lot of guys because I had enough of horsing around already. Mm -hmm. I had those two, two months of my all my leaves and all that I accumulated. So when I was discharged, I was ready for the world, outside world. Where, where did you then uh, work in your junior career? <laughs> you name it, you got enough fingers on your hand. <laughs> for the many jobs I tried and all. So I became a milkman. And that was due to the fact that. Uh, you became a what? I didn't a know. milkman. I house the house delivery at the tail end of it, too. And uh, I would, uh, got in that industry because my brother in law, he was a milkman. His best friend was a milkman. Bet you drove a Defco truck. You better know I did. When I was 12 years old, I worked in a body shop, and I sanded more Defco <laughs> trucks that became milk trucks than you can count. <laughs> well, they, they were good, uh, uh, really a good uh, thing besides a horse and buggy days. There still was horse and buggies for milk deliveries at the time. Yeah, Brown Creamery was one of them in Detroit. Was about the last one that had a horse and buggies. No, I, I got it fortunate. It was a, a difficult. I loved that job. It was a good job, but then it got unsafe. It's like you don't see vendors on the street no. anymore. So how long did you work for the dairy? Dairy, 33 years. 33 years. 
I worked first, like I say, the house to house delivery. Then I went into the commercial part. And then the company got so big, it was merging and taking every bankrupt company they could have. The lawyer must have been, he was a shyster, I think. And he talked to Boston to buy it one off the of which had more men than this, but they were Jersey Creamery. And uh, they had more men than I lost my son. I had about 12 years, 13 years of seniority, and I lost that. And we had a discreet plan. I had enough seniority to bump into the, the ice cream plant, and I finished up in, in the ice cream division. And it was delivering ice cream to commercial places. Too. And then, yeah, on Satan, well, we lost some bigger chains and stores. I got in the section where it was on safe already. So I asked if there was a chance to get in the plant and I worked in the plant and help them out in the ice cream division where I worked in the freezer. So when they made the ice cream, I'd store it in the freezer. I see. Well, uh, during this time, I'm sure you, you became married and had a family or Well, like whatever. I say, due to the fact that my name is Army Service was Jack Kaczewski, my wife and I, when we expect the first child, we talked it over, not really talked it over, I was more or less told we are going to change your name, and we did change your name. And then that's why I'm Gregory now, and that's why a lot of my class, Army uh, reunions I missed because of the change of name, there's lost the records. And, and, and this was in 1991, your name was legally changed? No, my name was legally changed in 19... I, the first child was born in 1952. I changed your name in 51. 1951, I changed my name. Okay. When, when were you married? We got married on November 27, 1946. So that that was a that was a girl that you knew from school, was it or no? Uh, she, gra she graduated a uh, half year after. I graduated June '41. She graduated in uh, January '42. I didn't know her in school, but the art cloud I was mentioned that uh, that New Year's Eve party we had that summer. The crowd got to know these girls. I didn't meet her the first time the crowd met. They went up and make the picnic grounds in the, here in Utica and all the other places here. 1920 Marble, North Polish, Greenfield, Green, Green Glen, and there's quite a few of them in this neighborhood up here. So that's where they went, and I met her on her graduation day. And like, hey, you don't know, no, uh, I. That's the girl for me. No way, no way, Jose. Four times she says, You eat nine. So uh, we got married after her stepdad passed away. And then she says, Are you still interested? Would you like to date? I said, Definitely. So, so I, take, I take it she wasn't Polish. Oh, yes, she was. Oh, was she? Oh, oh. hell yeah. She had 30 letters out of Chishevsky. Oh, my. She had 12 letters, so when her boss told her letter when she said she was engaged, they gave my name. He said, from well, 12 to 13 letters. <laughs> he said, man, you didn't prove it. <laughs> so I was like this. We had the Polish wedding. Had over 250 people. That was food was ration. Liquor was the liar ration. So I bootlegged. Uh, I went to Chicago and got my liquor. Uh-oh. Golden wedding. I brought it back. And at that time, when we served, we had turkey, because it was Thanksgiving Day. And uh, that was about the last time I heard that they allowed liquor being served. You could leave the bottles on the table. If, now you can't have that no more. But that was one of the bigger weddings. Where, where was that, in Hamtramck area? Mm -hmm. We got married at her church, which was quite a philosophy. And then uh, we had a reception in uh, Detroit. Ryan Road. Yeah. 
you have a, you have a, a big family, you and your wife, or? No, I wouldn't. Well, for what people now say, we had three children. Had a girl that was my first, the second was a boy, and the third was a girl. And my wife lost my boy. He enjoyed life, let's put it that way. Huh? He was a good mechanic. Went to school, got a good degree, worked for Chrysler for about 20 years. But he never married. And uh, living in the high life, if, if you drink and eat, don't eat, you ain't gonna survive, I'll tell you that. He suffered. What enjoyments he had, he suffered those less. In fact, uh, when I met him, I was, just came back from the bank and he was passing by. And he, he sent him home from work. He was buying a paper. I turned around, I was passing. I don't know what's I turned around and I said, Daniel, you look like a chink. That's how yellow he was. His liver stuff was far away. Oh my. And uh, like, that was about September. And next April he passed away. 38 years old. What a waste. Why do we see? You gotta get married, yeah. or else have a damn good cook. Right. <laughs> how how long were you and your wife married, or are you? Oh, we years? were married uh, till the uh, from forty six to December oh five. That's when she passed away. Yeah, Fifty nine years. We were just gonna start at sixteen. Oh, that's. We were on our way here at sixteen. That was nice. Nice time. Well, man. hey. I had that one brother says, boy, he had a wonderful life. Never argued, never. And I told him he's full of, <laughs> no way are you going to live, two people live together and have two never, minds. Never argue, right? Yeah, that's why he ended up, what you call that, that you lost your memory? I'm a, I am a, I am a, what do you call that, disease? Uh, he, Alzheimer's? He, old timers, yeah. And I told him, I says, uh, you are a yes man. I said, you always were a leader and all that. I said, but you, as a person, let the woman run you. It's nice to get advice. A man's a man. And let women know that. And like I say, I don't know how you treat your husbands. My wife let me do my way. <laughs> if she did that, they'd do my way anyway. What the <laughs> or if it was wrong, you'd... Correct the paperwork, make it right. <laughs> well, my father said when it was black, he said it was white. It had to be white. Not, no, I wasn't that bad. My children's baby did, but I was, I was a strict bird. The kids had to be in at a certain time. Meals were always, he did like a no set time for meals. Mother would prepare it and it'd be on the stove. We ate that, that's why we ate at our, our place. You didn't get nine of us at a table. Mm -hmm. All right. Need a pretty big table. Yeah. So, like I said, she'd prepare it and then we'd help ourselves. Oh. Pat, do you have anything that you'd like to ask? Uh, I would like to mention just uh, two things. You uh, talked about the chocolate bars and your rations, but how about the food? Did you live on sea rations and hay rations, or did you ever get any hot meals when you were overseas? No, I was, I was fortunate, like it was mentioned, that I was with the state, and I always been with an outfit that we got good meals. I wasn't up front where I got all these rations. The C rations, K rations, we'd get them. That was because we were traveling within that time to uh, uh, for the cooks to prepare a meal. Right. But we, uh, I was fortunate, I was with an outfit that are in the organization that we got hot meals. We were out for it. Like I say, and uh, I never could complain. Just on one night, a certain cook did not to make but you saved SOS. The, but you saved the uh, chocolate bars from the rations, though, right? Oh, I, hey, I, I would then smoke. So what I do when I get my monthly ration, there was my sergeant, he loved to smoke a cigar or chew the cigars. So. I have my cigarettes, I would trade or get cigars for him and we trade. I'd get the candy and give him the 
cigarettes. I didn't really start smoking until I was about 28. Really, you know, naturally you have a puff or two, but there was no inhaling and stuff. I was an athlete that played basketball until about 48, 49. Then I was still in sports, played softball until about 55. I was pretty active as far as athletic. Yeah, you mentioned the, the SOS, right? That's, that's something that I enjoyed. <laughs> Most people didn't, yeah. but I, I sure did. I'll tell you, if a cook knew how to prepare it, yeah. or even scramble eggs, these, uh, as they used to have, uh, powdered scrambled eggs, if you knew a cook, if the cook knew any, anything about cook, they were good deals. But if they just put the powdered milk with the powdered eggs and scrambled and fried it, there was no no meal. There was a little no food. But like I says, SOS. Yeah. First time I tried, I didn't like it, but the, 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 I got into a cup that knew how to prepare. Maybe, maybe I'll just leave it at that. We start talking about that. Ooh, uh, and we'll that get that. Sense, censor our tape here. <laughs> How about well, the uh, GI Bill? Did you take advantage of it? Yes, I did take advantage of it. That's one other reason I had my name changed. Just like Jim O'Veary can't pronounce my name. I took a county. Just like I said, I had a commercial course in uh, high school. And then I went to that uh, higher little education for about four months before I was drafted. And uh, I tried to get into a county. I did well. I thought I did. I had good grades and all that, but handicapped by the name. People didn't like us pull-ups from Amtranic. Hmm. What a great! I don't know what they had. They had against us. And that was probably true with a lot of well, ethnic Italians. groups in yeah. uh, various parts of the country, yeah. depending on where you, where you lived yeah. and so forth. And uh, yeah, we got a bad name uh, because, well, I'll tell you. During the Depression, these people didn't start. They made their own booze and sold it. Let's, let's put it that way. Maybe that's where, because I know the feds came into town quite a bit, and the streets were loaded, and you could smell what the, what the brew, home brew. And then the fact that there were a few where now the Chevrolet had their factory there, and now the the Merkin Axel has the factory there. There was a lot. And you would pass that lot. Boy, who used to get a quick drunk. <laughs> you that rye and that corn and all that stuff that you read that they threw out that lot. Woo! Them birds, they used to fly around. <laughs> them birds, I, I said, what the hell the birds are? It's so crazy for I found out they were eating the, eating the grains. <laughs> Beef and whiskey, 100 proof, proof, 120. They didn't know whether they were coming or going, did they? Well, after, they after the war was over, the government issued a prisoner of war medal. Did you get a prisoner of war yes, medal? Yes, I did get my medals. Because I noticed it wasn't on your discharge because it came to be after, after the war was over. It was 15 years later, at least. Yeah. At least. In fact, I read in uh, one article that they were going to give the prisoner of war uh, Purple Heart. And I couldn't see that. Myself, I would like to get a, a Purple Heart, but unfortunately, it's good for the people that were wounded. They, 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 they deserve some. Did you uh, belong to any organization? Oh, yes, I, like I Veterans of Foreign Wars or whatever? Oh, I belonged to the Disabled American Veterans. I first, when I got discharged, they were in like they're doing now. I got early, they were still on points for, like I said, I got discharged out of medical. But uh, the American uh, Red Cross was my, uh, they got me going on with my uh, disability. And then when I got in, out of service, my cousins, they joined the uh, disabled veterans and they knew we were veterans. And so I got in with, the, with that of the, the first called uh, Eastside Chapter 60, and uh, one of the officers that originated that became a charter member, he, he got, he had a silver star. I didn't know that. So when he passed away, they named the chapter after him, Cass. 
Zabek, chapter 16. So I'm a life member of, chat, uh, of uh, 16. And, uh, he introduced me to his uh, service officer, and I had good service officers. Never complaining. People complain about the the veteran organization, uh, their Eagles Hospital or the Allen Park. I had no problems really. I, I had good service. The only thing I had to do, had one complaint about, is a stinking eye clinic. What a mess that place is. Mm. They, they can't seem to get that, that, that department organized. It's just one of the lousiest department that gets service. It's thousands and thousands to change over of a month. Of, of, as far as uh, I did get good service, and I still get good service from the Veterans Administration. Like I say, there that is one of the, and they're getting more better and better right along. In fact, instead of, I wish the whole country would get in a plan like they have. And it is a well organized organization, and they're improving. They're improving. And, uh, they got more or less a program where they get a lot of interns. Right. That, that they, they train the people. Well, that's good to hear. Well, I guess we should kind of wind up our interview. Really enjoyed uh, visiting with you today. And, you know, again, want to thank you for your service to the country. And, you know, you and others really, really did a lot for Well, I wasn't part, part of protection. service, people. I just came back last summer. I went on this. Uh, honorary flight and that's the Washington DC. You have to Washington DC. Yeah, enjoyed it real good. But it's, it was a compact program. I mean compact. If you do you, you the rules are even hard to place to go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I th I thought I'd bring back a lot of souvenirs. And we were the second last from Detroit. Have one place in the now. Were you impressed with the memorial and the museum? Oh yes, we were there. Uh, in fact, the day I went there on that was a uh, Saturday. They had a ceremony. They had uh, the senator Hart and his wife. I think his he couldn't make it, but his wife did. And they had, and it was a. Uh, anniversary of the signing of the peace with Germany. And speaking of that, we can get it out. I was at this, care, uh, this hospital, an evacuation hospital, and I stand outside, and when the holy hell broke out, that's when the, they surrendered. And I didn't know, I thought we were being invaded. <laughs> I go again. I go again. I thought for sure we were going to get, you know, that, that we were being invaded. Mm -hmm. France. That's the hospital I was in at the time. And then stars and everything fired. I guess everybody had a firearm or a let it loose. Boy, that was oh, oh, that was bad. I said, holy shit. This whole sky lit up and everything. Flares all kinds shoot up. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, I gotta find me a hiding place. <laughs> <laughs> now, like I say, I was asked, or even talked about, would I change my experience of the Army for a million dollars? I said, you wouldn't, you could, I wouldn't sell it for the world. The same thing with my life. I thought I lived a good life. Got married, had children, they went to school, they got an education. One became a lawyer. Now my grandson is studying. He's in the last year. So I, I think I had a pretty good, complete life. Good Lord look at me. That's great. He still take care of it yet. Yeah, well, you seem to be pretty healthy, so that's great. <laughs> that's the liquor in me. <laughs> oh, well, I think that's about enough. <laughs> well, thanks again, Richard. We really, really appreciate the okay, you're really having part you. of the uh, greatest generation. Oh, I hate. That's what I heard about that. 
that is one of the best things. There's a poem someone wrote in it at the, our ending dinner. This person came up and she gave it up. I'd like to get it. If anybody knows what that, that, what that poem was, I'd love to get it because it really told the history of us people of, in, of this generation. And I mean, we went to holy hell, you know, right. two wars, right. big wars. We went to, uh, and then the depressions. Now we got one that I think my son will ask me, what do I think about this depression compared to the one they call the Great Depression, the Black Market one? Well, I said, I can't compare it. No way can I compare it. I says, you were having a hell of a time. I says, I couldn't do it. I wasn't a worker. I was a, not even a teenager. Right, you were just a child. I, I was eight years old or so when that broke. I says, I can't compare it. All I know was stuff. I had hand me down for five boys, four boys. Only one, my mill boy. The mill guy, he was short. And all of us were about the close to six foot. So he was about five, eight, five, seven. Blood, you know, all the we were all down here. Now I say, where'd you come from? <laughs> <laughs> He's living yet. He's the only one. Brother, that's left. Three of them all hit the dust already. Yeah. Not it. Okay. Well, so thank you very well, much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.